as you probably know, a lot of the power is is largely back on. But Orange County took a, took a really hard hit. Uh, you know, the president was here on Saturday. What's your message for those folks who are dealing with with yet another um, another natural disaster? Well, the folks out in East Texas are uh, pretty resilient. This isn't their first rodeo, their first hurricane. But I think we were all a little bit relieved that uh, uh, it took a right hand turn. I feel bad for our friends in Louisiana, and we certainly support them and and anything we can do to help them. But I know uh, that while there was property destruction in uh, in Orange, uh, uh, I don't believe there was any loss of life, which we are grateful for. But it is also a reminder that we need to get ready for the next hurricane. Uh, this is not gonna be the last one. And so one of the things when I was there uh, with the governor on uh, Thursday, um, we talked a little bit about the Sabine uh, pass to Galveston project and the enhancement of the levee system there, which is part of the storm surge system that we've been working on for years. And ultimately uh, we hope to see the Ike Dyke or the coastal spine uh, in place, but that's that's uh, going to be sometime in the future. And we know there, there are large areas of the upper Texas coast uh, that are unprotected, so to speak, at this point, right? So this, for Absolutely. folks who are not familiar with the, the so-called Ike Dyke, this is to, to shore up areas, including Orange County, right? That's right. And particularly to protect the Houston Ship Channel, because obviously the huge amount of commerce uh, goes through that, uh, through that ship channel that has national implications to our economy. And uh, so the, uh, we, we're expecting a report from the Army Corps of Engineers by March on their recommenda recommended design. And then it's up to working with each of the uh, uh, stakeholders there, the state legislature and the governor to figure out what's, what's the right design. And then we have to figure out uh, how to pay for it. I was going to say, is that going to be sort of a, a local, state, federal split potentially, or what? What kind of funding formulas would y'all be looking at? Well, typically that's what it is. We, uh, you know, Orange County uh, uh, stepped up. They they were a little bit concerned about their financial cost share for the levy system that I talked about a moment ago, but the Commissioner's Court uh, agreed to work with the core and and the Texas Legislature and create a special. Uh, entity which will help them with their cost share. I know it gets a little bit bogged down in the details, but um, yeah, it's not. It's it's hard just to get free money from Washington D.C. We're going to have to. I think everybody's going to have to have some skin in the game. But I can't tell you exactly what that's going to look like yet. But uh, that that will be the next big challenge once all the stakeholders decide on what the what the correct design is. And and it's an installation and funding funding and I guess installation is we're looking what five ten fifteen years what do you think? Well, Any ballpark? I, I'm an optimist. Um, I, let's say the, the the shorter the period that you mentioned. Um, okay. We we um, but here's here's the deal. I think we were able to get about thirty billion dollars in financial disaster relief as a result of Hurricane Harvey from the federal government. That's something I and the rest of the Texas delegation worked on along with the governor. And uh, we were able, we were, I think, able to meet that need. But you can imagine how, uh, if we can save just a part of that uh, from the next hurricane and then the next hurricane and the next hurricane, uh, this investment in this coastal spine system and this storm surge system will ultimately end up saving money. I want to talk just a little bit about the more about the storm before we move on. And we're getting some questions about um, FEMA's individual assistance opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I'm reading, there are parishes in Louisiana, even uh, not coastal parishes that are already getting clearance for individual assistance. Uh, it does not appear that, that Orange County is you know, at that point yet. Can you help us understand why? Well, it's a it's a good news, bad news story. Um, the, the good news is we didn't get hit as hard as uh, some of those places in Louisiana. Um, as Governor Abbott said, we, we dodged a bullet, but there are financial thresholds that ordinarily have to be met in order to get qualified for that uh, individual assistance. But we're, we'll keep working with, uh, with the governor and local officials there in FEMA. Uh, so far, Nim Kidd, the chief of the, of the Texas Department of Emergency Management, has said they have been um, really bent over backwards to be responsive 
uh, to our needs in Texas. So we'll keep working with them on that to make sure that Texas residents get everything they, they need and deserve. You know, my, my follow up question was just something I was pondering. If if this storm had, you know, hit only in one state, you know, if it was if this was solely a Texas storm, would Orange County be in a different place or does the does the state line matter in this case? I would like to think it doesn't matter um, because and I think certainly when you saw the president come down and survey the damage, he spent some time both in Louisiana and in Texas. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's just that we, uh, you know, where we're situated uh, near the Gulf during hurricane season, uh, this is one of the, one of the familiar paths. And uh, like I said, we've been through this before, but I think, you know, certainly at the federal level, um, the, there's no sort of picking favorites. Um, and I think, uh, I think we'd see the same level of response, no matter what, uh, where the, where the hurricane hit. So individual assistance may still be an option. Y'all are working with with the governor's office and TDM. Yes, I need to uh, make I, we we need to double check the thresholds and and see uh, see whether we qualify. But certainly, if we do qualify, then uh, we'll certainly be uh, asking uh, FEMA to follow through. And uh, so far, they've been very cooperative. You know, this this conversation this this storm came as you know in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we are roughly two months till election day. I want to ask a little bit about um, COVID concerns um, mm -hmm. and, and what your thoughts are about precautions that, that are planned at polling places um, or additional precautions you feel like should be considered. Well, I think we've learned a lot from this virus. Uh, some of what we thought was true didn't turn out to be true. Some things we, we thought we knew, we found out we didn't know. So. Um, I think one of the things that we now have learned is that the virus is going to be with us uh, for the foreseeable future. I'm hoping that we get a vaccine before the end of the year, but then there'll be the issue of how do you distribute the vaccine on a, to the most vulnerable first, which would be the elderly and people with underlying chronic disease. And uh, so what we are experiencing now is I've fl flown around the state visiting schools is uh, we're seeing people transition their children back to either a hybrid situation, online learning or in-person uh, education. And I think what we're learning, what I'm learning is that by doing the things that uh, public health officials have told us we need to do, which is wash our hands, wear masks when we can't socially distance and, and social distance when we can, um, and then uh, stay home when you're sick, that that is a formula that works, whether it's kids going back to school or voters going to the polling location. Texas has the most generous, one of the most generous uh, uh, polling or voting uh, laws in the country. If you're over 65, you can request a mail-in ballot. If you're gonna be absent or you're disabled, you can do the same. Uh, otherwise, we have like three weeks where you can vote safely in person. And I think observing those same protocols, which is what we did in the primary, uh, we can, you can also uh, do that safely. And then of course there's election day. So there's, there's no reason that I can think of that the COVID virus would prevent people from exercising one of those three options to make sure their vote counts. Is this a year where you would encourage more Texans than ever to vote early? I know we continue to see those metrics going up. seems like with every election. I think that's almost always a good idea. Uh, we so I'm from San Antonio originally and and I remember uh, we had really long lines one, one election and people all of a sudden said, well, I guess we could vote early in person. And uh, now that's what my wife and I do on a standard basis. So uh, you can uh, have plenty of social distancing and, and vote at your convenience safely in early voting. I think that always makes sense. Is there a state mandate for any um, drive-in voting where folks could come, you know, poll workers could come to people's car windows? Is there any provision for that? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'm not excluding the possibility that could, but I'm not familiar with that. Uh, okay. Of course, we've, we've had some experience with drive-through uh, testing and uh, things like that. Uh, we've had to be, uh, we've had to adapt uh, to the virus and, and maybe that would be uh, something we should explore. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned schools in COVID, the hybrid learning that's happening um, I know a lot of the districts that kind of had the extra time are, are planning to resume in person next week. Um, 
what's your message? We have a lot of rural areas here in Southeast Texas, as you know. What is your message for families that still don't have the proper uh, technology, whether it's internet or actual devices like laptops? Well, this COVID, this uh, virus has, has shown us this uh, gap in coverage is, is not about convenience. It really has become a necessity. And whether it's continuing your education safely online or taking advantage of the telemedicine opportunities, which have really uh, grown and proliferated and shown to be very, very useful in providing access to health care in rural areas. But you're right, in, in many areas of the state, they simply don't have the uh, broadband or, or, uh, coverage. Many of the school districts are working to provide that for their students, either by purchasing hotspots using federal funds or by uh, opening up the parking lots where people can work in their car, but obviously in the heat of the, heat of the uh, September, that's not optimal. So we've invested a bunch of money uh, at the federal level in this, but there's more we need to do. And my, my request of my staff is come back to me on a big, bold plan because we need to, we need to make sure that everybody has access uh, to the internet uh, for all sorts of good reasons, whether it's to continue their education or, for, to, or to do business or to, uh, to get access to healthcare. And we're not there yet. We know sometimes it's tough to get deals done, but is this a, an issue where you feel like there should be uh, some bipartisan agreement? I can't think of any good reason why there shouldn't be a bipartisan agreement. As you know, the first four uh, COVID-19 bills we passed, we did it essentially unanimously, spending about $3 trillion uh, something I never thought I would uh, be called upon to vote for, but I did because I knew it was an emergency. So this is this is something that makes sense and uh, something we ought to do. And um, hope springs eternal. We will we'll, we'll stay at it until we get it done. Um, my news colleagues uh, from our sister station, KCEN in Waco, wanted to talk just a little about um, the ongoing investigations at Fort Hood. Um, I know you've, you've been watching what's happened there the Vanessa Gann case, probably the most high profile, but there, there are several troubling developments there. And, and what would you say to the military families who have loved ones stationed there? Well, what we've seen happen at Fort Hood is unacceptable. Uh, it's unacceptable to their families. It's unacceptable for the young men and women who serve in our military. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, Secretary of Army, uh, Ryan McCarthy, he's called me after his trip there and visiting uh, and now is appointed an independent commission uh, to study the study the problem. They'll come back with a report to Congress, and then I've asked the Senate Armed Services Committee to have a hearing uh, so that we can air um, the, and uh, what uh, what what they've discovered and and come up with a solution because what what we've seen happen at Fort Hood is simply uh, unacceptable, and uh, we've got to get to the bottom of it, and we will. Do you have any any thoughts on why why Fort Hood? What's different than the other military bases? Well, that's the that's the question we want to answer because I'm this is not normal uh, for other military bases, and I don't know whether it's the lack of leadership uh, by the by the military leadership there, or uh, or it's problems in the local uh, area off the base that have somehow found their way onto the base, it's, that's, those are the sorts of things we need answers to uh, because this has just been painful for the families to be sure. Uh, and it's painful for those of us who care about our men and women in, in the military who serve us and, and defend us and protect our, our liberty. Uh, so I'm eager to get that report from the Army's special commission that uh, Secretary McCarthy appointed. And then, uh, then we will have a public hearing uh, on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and then come up with a with a an agenda of how to solve the problem, how to make sure this doesn't happen again. I have just a couple of minutes left. I, I want to wrap up by asking you about Governor Abbott's uh, hints this week about reopening the rest of Texas. We have a lot, a lot of um, you know bar owners in our region and across the state that have managed um, to reclassify themselves as restaurants based on their percentage of sales and reopen. But, you know, a lot of brewery owners um, are sitting back saying, you know, th this is this doesn't work. This isn't the way that we should be playing the game. 
what do you think should come next as far as getting Texas back to work, back to business? Well, public safety has to be consideration number one, but there's no doubt in my mind that we need to continue to reopen uh, the economy as, as long as we can safely do it. Uh, the numbers, which you're probably following, like I'm following for hospitalizations and ICU beds uh, are, are, are coming down. And the, the positivity rate is coming down into the roughly 10% range, where uh, which uh, Governor Abbott and others have said is sort of a, a, a landmark. Um, so when I was with the governor over in, uh, in, in Beaumont uh, and in uh, Orange recently after Hurricane Laura, he indicated to me that we could anticipate further announcements after Labor Day. Uh, so I think to me that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's encouraging, uh, but certainly no reason for complacency. But I know a lot of people uh, have been hurt badly through no fault of their own and we'd like to, I know we'd all like to get our lives back to uh, uh, closer to normal. Uh, although we're gonna have to maintain some of these best practices until we get a vaccine at least. What's your message for people who are still, um, how shall I say this? You know, the, the masks have become, a, you know, in some ways a, a partisan issue. And, um, you know, we've heard about families, you know, walking into restaurants and being ridiculed for actually wearing them. What would you tell your constituents across Texas about the significance of saving lives and, and thinking about other Texans? Well, I would tell them, put your mask on. Um, you know, this is not a perfect solution. And certainly, you know, there's nothing magical about the masks. Primarily what it does is it shows respect for others so that if you have the virus, you're not going to inadvertently spread it. Um, but it's, it's a, in, a, in combination with these other measures, it is frankly what we need to do in order to make our way through this pandemic and to look at the virus in the rear view mirror. So I, I know it's not fun, and uh, it's uncomfortable, looks strange, but you need to put your mask on. 